morning. You know, we are finally nearing the end of this Lenten journey. And I got to tell you all, this is one of the most lentiest Lent I've ever Lented. I saw that as a meme this week, and I just had to laugh because it really has been an interesting Lenten journey. We are reminded every Lent of the nature of our humanity. We are reminded in this time is meant to be a time to address those ways in which we seek a deeper relationship with God. We either fast or we take on those practices that we feel will help that relationship. I hope as each and every one of us have journeyed this Lenten season, if you have taken opportunities to practice the spiritual fasting and discipline to enhance and build your relationship with God. However, we have not quite finished this journey yet. Today, we enter the last phase of this Lenten season. Today, this Palm Sunday begins our Holy Week, this week in which we view the last days of Christ. While it was not our scripture lesson this morning, normally we would hear the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and we will hear of the palm branches waved, donkey that is ridden. It invites us into this space of Holy Week, and it asks us to ponder this mess in our lives, to ponder the work that Jesus is about to do. It invites us to consider the message in the mess. Tom Berlin talks of it in his final chapter. He writes of this message from God in the mess saying that the message in the mess is you are deeply loved and with God's help you can have and become so much more than you are right now. The, the goal of the journey is full sanctification, becoming so available to the grace and love of God in our lives Respond to situations and circumstances the way that Christ would. This idea of per Christian perfection found in our understanding of grace is the message in the mess. The message in the mess that has led us this week in our series. We have progressed this journey, through this journey, this Lent, and it has brought us to this point in our faith walk remember that God's grace is not linear, rather that God's grace is holy an experience of life. We recognize our need for God's grace in different times in our lives and in different ways. We started six weeks ago at the very beginning, exploring the nature in which we were created in God's image, this understanding that we have gained through our Christian faith known as the Imago Dei, the image of God, and how God creates within each one of us this image, this image of love, this image of grace. And despite our best efforts, that image of God becoming distorted through the mess apparently comes into play in our lives, this mess of sin and this mess that distorts God's image. Despite our best efforts to distort or to misconceive this image of God, God constantly reaches out in the manner of pervenient grace. God's posture of towards us is that of always reaching, always seeking to be in relationship with us. Pervenient grace that is present in our Wesleyan tradition. Next, we observe the understandings of confession and repentance that take the form of, of grace being justified in our lives. The understanding that we seek to change our posture towards God. We seek to reach back in the ways that God has reached towards us. However, it does not end with that confession and that repentance. But it makes itself known in the manners that we surrender to who God calls us to be. And as we saw in the manner that Paul speaks, of putting to death the old self 
and taking on those new ways of God and considering those words that Jesus has for Nicodemus of new birth. week, we began to bring it home by starting us on this journey of perfection, to look at this work of sanctification that takes place in our lives, and to look at that opportunity that we have to sit at the feet of Christ, to learn and to grow in God's grace. These, these acts of piety that we take part in, whether it's reading and meditating on scripture, an intentional act of prayer in our lives in which we learn Christ. We examined our need for these spiritual disciplines in our lives. We began to, to, to talk about those ways in which we grow deeper in God's love. And now this week, we close it all out by exploring the message in all of this. We come to this understanding that we have, a, that we have, Seeing the need to adjust our posture towards God. We have committed to doing the work of healing and restoration. And now we look for what this all means and how our lives are truly transformed. We come to the conclusion Tom Berlin has given us, and we take this cue from Paul live out our faith. The tangible example of this healing and transformative work that takes place in our lives. We're looking for healing and transformational love. And the message in the mess is that that is possible. But what is our response? Our response is how do we do this? We know that God's love is transforming our lives. We know that we are called to sit at the feet of Christ and to learn through spiritual discipline. How does this work of transformation Partially, we answered this question in last week's sermon as we talked about those works of piety that Wesley talks about. But this week, we take it a step further and look at the other half of those means of grace. Not just those works of piety, but also those works of mercy that make themselves known as we seek to live out our faith. Consider the ways in which how we sit in God's love impacts the ways in which we interact with our community and those around us. God is doing a good work in us. And our living of a transformed life is the other half of that equation. It is in growing in God's grace that we recognize the ways that God's healing, God is, God's grace is healing and transforming us. We become more whole and we journey our path towards Christian perfection. In Philippians, Paul tells us I'm sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you. Complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. That is truly a good word. We seek to know that God is always with us. As we seek to know that God is always working within us for a second who Paul is addressing when he writes the book of Philippians. Consider the context in which he is doing this. Paul is offering a prayer of thanksgiving to these people, and he is writing this letter in a time of desperation in his life when he is imprisoned in Rome. Paul is offering a word of hope to one of the earliest Christian communities in Greece. Paul is preaching to the people of Philippi the importance of staying committed to this work of faith. In the midst of all of this, Paul is reminding God's people that God is still always will be at work within them. This work of perfection, this work of grace 
This work of sanctification, of justification, of provenience is always happening within us. He says, this is my prayer. That your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray that you will then be filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes from Jesus Christ, in order to give glory and praise to God. Sees the outcome of this faith in God as a greater understanding and offering love. As we seek to live our lives in that same understanding of love, the same grace that is present before we acknowledge it, the same grace that forgives us in all our mess, the same grace that empties and prepares us, the same grace that moves and works within us as we seek a closer relationship with God, that same grace, same grace that will perfect us, that will make us whole, that will bring us, to respond in everything in the same love that God has given to each and every one of us. The tough work. We think that our belief in God automatically makes us perfect. We believe our faith in God makes us better, makes us holier than thou. The thing is, perfection is a journey. automatic transformation. Berlin talks about this. It's that, it's that work of physical therapy that over time, God continues to heal and transform us. God continues to address the mess in our lives, the mess from before and the mess from during and the mess that will inevitably come in our lives. You can see hints of it as we seek to go and to live in the love that God has given to each and every one of us. We talked about last week, Wesley termed this understanding as a means of grace. We talked about these works of mercy, those works of mercy that we talked about last week, of prayer, of scripture, of worship, of sacraments, of engaging, of, of conferencing. In fact, these works of piety, both individual and communal. And this week, we look at those works of mercy, these acts in which we, we experience the means of God's grace, serving side by side God. Acts, these works of mercy are embodiments of how we have grown in our faith by spending that time at the feet of Jesus. For true faith, Wesley maintains that both of these works of means of grace are needed, that we need both these works of piety, that we need to sit at the hands and feet of Christ, and then that we also need to serve side by side with God, and that in both of these, we both experience God's grace and grow in God's grace. Wesley identifies works of mercy as the individual practices of doing good work, visiting the sick, visiting those who are in prison, feeding the hungry, and giving generously to the needs of others considered communal practices to be seeking justice, ending oppression and discrimination. Wesley challenged Methodists to end human slavery. And then he also encouraged people in addressing the needs of the poor. These were ways that Wesley saw that we could serve right alongside God. That is in both sitting at the feet of Christ and serving alongside him, that we not only experience God's grace, we not only grow in God's grace, we become perfected in God's grace, and that these then can become expressions that we give to others of that grace that we have wholly experienced. Wesley contended very early in his faith that these works, these are not acts of justification. We are not justified by our works. Wesley believed that we were justified in our faith through faith alone. But Wesley believed that this journey of perfection and sanctification that we go through in our lives, ways in which 
we grow in God's love come out of both sitting at the feet of Christ and serving alongside of him. Imagine as Christ says it himself in Matthew 25, I assure you that when you have done it for the least of these, of my brothers and sisters, you have done it for me. These are solemn reminders that as we go through this life, that the message in the mess that we experience is that God is ever working to transform and to restore that image of God within us. We have been reminded over and over and over again that this work of healing, transformation, and restoration are not easy. They are very much worth it as they deepen that relationship with God manners of works of piety and works of mercy are what bring us along this journey. And it is in these works that we journey along the process of entire sanctification. Look towards that understanding of Christian perfection in our lives. We can feel disconcerted in this effort. We can become weary of the time that it takes on this journey. So Tom Berlin, in his book, he speaks of this understanding of assurance. We often look for and seek assurance. And Berlin tells that sanctifying grace can help to bring that assurance. Saying four ways that it does this work, that we trust in God's love, that we are confident in God's abilities, we believe in God's future, that we can be perfected in God's love. And it's in these four ways that Berlin tells us that this work of sanctifying grace assures us of that work that God is doing within each and every one of us. We trust and believe that God is working within us. We hope to reach that point of complete oneness with God and with God's vision for the kingdom. And as Charles Wesley say, says in his great hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling, finish then thy new creation. Pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation. Perfectly restored in thee. Journey into this week. I want you to focus your hearts and minds as we enter this holy week of continuing to examine that posture towards God and leaning more on his everlasting arms, continuing to engage in those understandings of means of grace. It's in this work that we see the message in the mess is the nature of transformation and healing can take place in our lives. Amen.